All right, you guys are at Steve Morris Engines. I'm gonna show you a little bit of stuff on how things actually work. So this block, as you're gonna see, has O-rings in it and they're not supposed to and we're changing this all over. So I'm taking these O-rings out and it is, a, it is a real bugger. So let me show you how that works and then I'm gonna show you why we had to take these things out. And there you go. That's how you take that out. It is a, it is a bugger to do. But uh, and it kind of take me a little bit of uh, practice here to figure out how to do it. It's much easier to take these things out on an aluminum cylinder head than it is in a cast iron sleeve. But trying to do the minimal amount of damage rather than just picking and building a hole into it. And you can see here, right here. That's all there is, and it's just a little bit of discoloring. But nice and clean, a little bit of discoloring, so really nice. <laughs> Sometimes in fact, most of the time, it's just figuring out exactly how to do something. So what you have to do here on the sleeve is very low amperage with a very sharp tungsten. I'm trying to actually weld on top of a 041,000 stainless steel wire and attach, probably ought to, you know, I could probably attach the, uh, grab me a piece of stainless rod out of there. Smaller stainless rod to it, and then you can pull it out of there <laughs> without effing up the sleeve all the way around it. Done a really good job on these two. Don't even want to show you this one because it's pee poor. Is this that small sandwich? Yeah, that's fine. That's right. In your face, wire. In your face. I got all the wires out. Didn't screw everything all up. Happy about that. First time I've had to take the, they actually did a really good job of putting the wire in there. <laughs> so good a job, it was really hard getting out. But we have to get it out because that's not what we want in there. Now I'm gonna show you how we put this block up, or actually I have Mitch show you how we put this block up in the Rottler machine. We cut a new receiver groove because we need to put the actual hoop in the head. We'll show you that, how that goes through the copper and how it goes into the receiver groove that's in the block instead of having this completely wrong like it was.
Now you just saw Mitch do the resurface and then do the receiver grooves for the hoops and the cylinder heads. So we'll show you how the cylinder head hoops work. But what's going on here is, just gave this a little haircut, made sure it's flat and square. So this thing is 10195 deck height right now, or the deck height is 10195. Discovered that this thing has been welded in this whole corner right here. So obviously this thing's been damaged, hurt before uh, we ever saw it and, and got it, but you can see the weld right here. Well, actually, I don't know if you can see the weld on the camera, but I guess we'll see. <laughs> and then uh, sleeves that are protruding into a uh, aluminum tend to drag a little bit on chips, so it's really hard to get a super nice, you know, perfect surface finish. So it's nice, it's smooth, but it has a little bit of uh, look to it, you know, a little bit of uh, dragging the chip across there. Not a big deal. Now, so what that receiver groove is now is the receiver groove is just a little bit wider. So let me hold it up this way. This is the receiver groove that we just cut in there. It's a little bit wider, wider than the hoop, than the stainless steel ring that goes in the cylinder head. This is the stainless steel ring that goes in the cylinder head. So this hoop in the cylinder head bolts down and goes pink. Basically just like that. Now there's a copper gasket in between it. So the, there's a copper gasket right here and the hoop comes down into the receiver groove and goes indents itself in there like that. So this is as far as I know, this, this is the way the top fuel guys do it. So since they make the most cylinder pressure out of anybody, I would say that that is still the best way of doing it. So, and that is the way we do it. So, that's how the hoop is. You saw it get resurfaced. Everything is nice and perfect square on the, on the old Rottler here of camshaft, crankshaft, center line, Dexter square. Now we're going to, we're, we ordered a new set of pistons for it and we just went up a couple thousandths to just a 4505 bore to make sure that we could get the bores perfectly, you know, really nice and clean, really nice and straight and, and uh, um, with, a, with a proper pattern on it. Unfortunately, my brand new hone has still not showed up, so we're still going to uh, hone this, the 5000s on the other hone, which is still fine. Not as good as the other one when we get it. And uh, let's see here, roll this thing over, Mitch. You can see here, the other side's looking really good. Same thing with the receiver grooves. So everything is all nice cut. All we're going to do is finish honing this thing to size, clean up, and this thing will be ready to go. Something else you want, might want to take note of is roller cam bearings. Now, roller cam bearings, in my personal opinion, I have not ever found a fault in them. I think that they are better all the way around. They are hard to machine in and, and um, I mean, it takes a bit of machine work to actually put them into a block, but they are always better. They usually are not going to be for a standard cam core. They're going to be for a large cam core like a 55 millimeter this would be a 55 millimeter camshaft in this engine so it's not just some cheap thing that you can do it's quite expensive and quite expensive camshaft it goes from you know like a five six seven eight hundred dollar camshaft to a fifteen hundred dollar camshaft and the job with the roller bearings is uh, around fifteen hundred dollars too so big upgrade in that um, but like I said Mitchell put this thing in the home We'll just hone this thing five thousandths over and this thing will uh, get ready to get cleaned up and we'll move over to the cylinder heads and doing putting the actual hoops in the cylinder head. So we got, Mitch has got the cylinder head up in our new cylinder head fixture on the Rottler. This thing is actually really super cool. And uh, it bolts onto this uh, <coughs> fixture plate that I made for, made for it this morning. So it bolts up, it's super solid. Everything's rock solid. But the thing is that's really cool about this 
is how it all adjusts. This level that they give you is accurate to a thousands. <laughs> I mean, it's the machinist level, but it is, we've been testing and playing with it. It is really good. If that bubble is in the middle, every line that is in a bubble is a one thousandth of an inch. We measured it and checked it. <laughs> it is actually one thousandths. And so what you do on their fixture, we take the tailstock out that holds for the, the block. So you take the tailstock out, you pick this thing up, you put it in. We just indicate it in on the back to make sure it's straight, right? Piece of cake. And then you put this bubble level on the cylinder head and you go boom. Done. <laughs> it is it is bad. So this this handle here, twist it. You got it locked? Yeah. Yeah, it's locked. This this handle here, so you unlock it, this handle rotates it this direction, and this one goes up and down on the end. When it's all leveled in there, hit it, zero, and then we double check it with the uh, you know sweeping it with an indicator like you would normally do, and it is spot on. I mean, it is spot freaking on, which is so fast, so easy to do. It's amazing. Uh, so this whole cylinder head fixture, and it is rigid. I mean, it is. I think it weighs. Well, the whole thing weighs 800 pounds. So it must. It's got to weigh. 200 plus pounds so anyways so Mitch is going to do a, a real light haircut to resurface it then we're going to put the hoops in it and we'll show you how we put the hoops in the stainless steel one piece compression ring hoop machined into the cylinder head so we'll mill this first show you how that works and then uh, uh, go into the uh, hoop Now we have already seen the receiver grooves in the block, resurface the block. Now I'll show you how Mitch is now installing and putting in the hoops into the cylinder head. Got a hoop? Uh, yeah. So you can see right here, we have it all laid out, leveled up, so we give this just a real light haircut right here. And then we use a single groove tool right here, and this cuts a groove to put this solid ring in. All right. So what this does is cut the groove. The groove, uh, the hoop is 85 thousandths tall. So it's 85 thousandths tall. Has we cut the uh, groove 65 thousandths deep, so it leaves 20 thousandths protrusion. So. That'll go in there just like that. I'm not gonna push that in because once it pushes in, it's usually stuck. <clears throat> so you push that in, you put your copper uh, gasket on your block, and that hoop right there, we'll show you how this cuts them, but that hoop uh, goes into the receiver groove in the block through the gasket, just like that. Kind of interlocks in there. So it is currently still what I feel is the best way of, of doing that. So let's show you how he does this.
all of the the hoops are being how we center everything up off of is off the dowel pin so we indicate in the dowel pin on the block and then go x y into where the receiver group goes receiver group receiver group then we do the inverse we indicate in off the dowel pins on the cylinder head flip it upside down hoop 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 that way everything lines up so as you can see it there um, does a really nice job. We used to do this with a single single uh, end mill and just let the machine circle a triple plate, but it takes a lot longer than this. And uh, I think that this, just from the sheer standpoint of speed, is a whole lot better. So anyways, Mitch is going to uh, finish these up and then uh, we'll show you when the hoops are all in and uh, start working on assembly. Okay, you just saw Mitch, who's just stepping out of the camera. Show Mitch. Yeah, there you go. Uh, just saw, saw Mitch, so he lapped the valves, and then he started working on the installed height. So, I'll talk about that. Let's look at the hoops right now. You can see here, this hoop is now pressed into that machined-in groove, and that is sticking out 20 thousandths of an inch. Gives us 40 thousandths of an inch in between, because it's on a 4800 bore. And big block Chevrolets are 40 bore spacing, which means there's 40 thousandths of room in between. So remember, that little O-ring there then is then going to go into the gasket and into the receiver groove. Beep, like that. Okay. So you saw I'm lapping the valves. That is just to do a quick, quick lap, 
uh, then clean off all the lapping compound, make sure it's clean. But that gives us a good indication of just verifying one more, one last time that the valve seats are concentric with the valve, that everything looks good. These were brand new valves, so uh, from Manly, everything looks good right there. And then to talk about the installed height, so you know what that was about. So you saw him checking the installed height uh, with one of these checkers. Are you using this black one? Yep. Yeah, so he's even using this black one. Um, so what we're doing is we're getting the dimension from underneath the retainer to the seat. So what that means is uh, we're getting the installed height of the spring. So we wanted to set the, insta set the installed height up on this so that we had about 320 pounds of seat pressure. Now, <coughs> excuse me, the seat pressure is um, all about camshaft profile. So the camshaft dictates what kind of spring pressure you're going to be requiring. So you need to talk to your cam guys, you talk with me if it's my camshaft. Uh, I can give you some good general things. But in this particular combination we have wanted to have about 320 pounds on the seat. And uh, that, that works real well and gives us good coil bind, uh, to, uh, coil bind distance. Uh, so full lift to coil bind. And what you probably didn't see, you didn't show us checking all the springs, did you? I did. Oh, you yeah. did show. So you also saw us checking all the springs and doing, or saw Mitch checking all the springs. And then we get a whole spring sheet. Uh, it's like a little spring dyno sheet of all the spring pressures. Yes, all the, oh, it's right there. So all the spring pressures. Now, if you want to see more of this, this would be like a half hour video because it literally is a half hour video of springs, heights, all sorts of stuff. Go to my Steve Tech. Uh, Tim will probably put up a card here on the valve spring setup. So if you want to check that out and go over there and there's a lot more detailed information on how you're checking it, what we're checking, why we're checking. So anyways, uh, we are now ready to, uh, Mitch is starting to lay some stuff out here and uh, some things are kind of a cluster cuss, it needs to pick up, but uh, this is, block is ready, see grooves are in it, uh, hone to final size, everything is all done there. So we'll start checking clearances and start assembling. just saw as Mitch is putting uh, Dennis's engine together now these are rods that that Dennis already had these are a set of BME rods and you see that that uh, that he had to use a feeler gauge in between the two rods and it's because of the way the serrations are on the connecting rods so like uh, the MGP rods or uh, GRP rods uh, but our normal stuff r and rods has more of a serration that locates and what used to be is they used to just do uh, for locating the caps on the rod they used to just have straight perfectly straight and you could torque up the cap on it and the cap would or the rod would be here and the cap would be over here it'd be perfectly round but it'd be offset and that would screw up your side clearance so you put the feeler gauges in there and torque them up which forces it all to be perfectly aligned and then you torque it all together don't have to do that on the uh, MGP rods and some of the others, but there you go. The uh, the red, oh this I get this question a lot. The uh, the red assembly lube is a Maxima engine assembly lube. That's what the red stuff is, and it's like a grease based, and it is so tacky, I couldn't get that apart. <laughs> it just was like stuck. 
<clears throat> so that's what's going on there. Got rotating assembly all all done here. I think everything's looking uh, looking pretty good here. I think everything's fine. Um, you know, I, you can't put everything here. Uh, should be good but you know I, these rods were were new not something that we supplied so a lot of stuff is some stuff that we didn't supply but i don't see anything wrong with it i think everything looks good so anyways this is going to keep on uh going here Okay, so you just saw Mitch uh, put the cylinder heads on, and we did the, uh, and we showed you the uh, copper gasket, O-ring slash hoop, fire ring hoop, and receiver groove. So I explained to you, you see over the clip of how it was done wrong before, and it's a, it's actually a fairly common mistake. But now you can see right here on the block, this O-ring, and that O-ring is fine that somebody put it in there. It's a little old school, but. Right here, you can see it does not line up with the gasket, and you can't use a steel gasket and an O-ring. So look right here. You're going to see exactly what I'm talking about. But um, just somebody just didn't think about it real quick. But the, uh, uh, the other gasket was a steel gasket, and you could see that they had machined a ring into the block, which was fine. But the head gasket, which was steel, I'll talk to you about that in a minute, the steel head gasket had a valve notch, so the steel head gasket was basically inside like this, which was all fine, and then it had a valve notch and went out there like that. So the ring didn't even hit the steel gasket in that valve notch area. But all of that really doesn't matter too awful much because it's still just not the right way of doing it. So what we, uh, steel O-ring, so let's imagine you got a little steel O-ring in your deck surface here, okay? Here's your cylinder bore. All right, you got this little steel O-ring popping out. All right, or just like that. Well, it doesn't really, a stainless steel ring doesn't really embed into, into a steel gasket. So what happens is that steel gasket, it's not soft like copper, so it just kind of tends to sit up there, makes a little gap, and then tends to leak water. Um, probably with steel compression, but tends to leak water. That's why, the better way of doing this is we do a machined in hoop into the cylinder head. So this is the cylinder head, okay, like that. So that's the cylinder head. And then with a little copper head gasket right here. And then the block is a receiver groove like that, okay. And so when this goes in there, it pushes that copper head gasket down into the groove 
and makes a really tight, super good seal for combustion pressure. And we still put a little bit of uh, uh, sealant out here if it's a water engine. So we still put a little bit of sealant out there for that. And, um, but that is a hoop fire ring uh, setup. This is machined into the cylinder head too. So this is a permanent deal. There's no splice, there's no anything. You have to machine it in the cylinder head, machine it into the block. That thing is a permanent deal. I mean, we can get it out and fix it, but uh, it goes through that copper gasket. Makes the best seal. Still the current deal that they use in top fuel. If it's good enough for top fuel with the most amount of cylinder pressure out of any engine combination period, it's probably good enough for this stuff. If there's any kind of problem that you ever have, it's typically because you don't have enough head bolts, like a LS, like a Viper, like, any, like a couple of small block Ford, <laughs> um, or even stuff that has uh, uh, five bolts or six bolts per cylinder. A lot of times it'll just not, not a strong enough clamping force on it. Cylinder heads weak, it flexes, moves, that kind of stuff. But that's what we are just fixing there. That was one of the major problems on that whole deal for uh, Dennis Thomas. Quit screwing around, Mitch, go back to work. All right, you guys just saw we put that engine together. I've got her strapped to the old dyno here. 
and we're going to get ready to make some preliminary pulls on it, make sure everything's good, get it started up, get it all warmed up, and then we're going to let her eat on the slow gear set. So we're targeting like 20 to 22 pounds of boost on this. All right, you guys just saw that last pull. We're making some headway now, I think. So let's take a look at the numbers. 1858 at 7,700, 1306 at 6,900. Nice looking graph. I would say that I'm gonna leave this tune probably alone and for this gear set, because this is gonna be the slowest gear set that this guy wants to run. This is like a, a one, 200 gear set, so. We're going to spin it a little bit faster tomorrow, so come in in the morning, check the valve lash, change the gear sets, and we'll put the big boy tune up in it. Well, big boy. This guy only wants to make like 2,000 horsepower, so um, I'm going to have to probably tame it down for him on the next gear set. Alrighty, so on Dennis Thompson's uh, last night, uh, made that pull, what, what, what horsepower did it make last night? I forget. 1858. 1858 now that's with the gear set that he already had in there so obviously we're going to turn it up we could make a little bit more on it probably could probably could make 1900 or so on it and uh, uh, then we need to change gear set anyways and what we always do is like to have it come in we dyno these things for the day and then like to have them cool down overnight we come in lash it all up so Kyle's lashing it up changing the gear set making sure everything's all right checking for hey things not leaking any oil that's cool uh, looks good there and just do good general check over uh, and probably even just uh, double check torque even though we've already retorqued this thing before anyways but change lash change gear set and then we'll uh, fire this thing back up and make a run Yeah, no, we can use this one. This one spins pretty fast, but I think that would definitely go over 2,000 with that one. So just put that one in there. Don't. This one's too fast. Okay. All right. Slap her together. This is actually a pretty handy little nice setup. This is actually the first one we've seen all this time. This is the first race drive we've taken apart and changed gear set on. So that's handy. Uh, quick and easy. Nice. Okay.
2051. This is on the first pull on this gear set too, so I'm pretty impressed with low timing. I made sure I pulled a bunch of timing out of it because I want to be safe, you know, but. Uh, yeah, 2051 at 7,200 and 1,502 foot-pounds of torque at 7,200. Just keep it on climbing. I mean, we're gonna rev this thing out a little bit further, so I'll, uh, I'll take a look at the plugs and we'll reassess where we're at. Just make sure everything looks good. I didn't forget to hook up the boost sensor on the dyno, but I'll just look at it in the data log. Fuel pressure looks good. Oil pressure looks good. Let's look at the data log here. Look at that. No timing, very rich. I'll take that all day long. This is so we just uh, I just came over. <laughs> this is this is where I come in and go. Oh yeah, see right, but, 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 and then it changes it. <laughs> so, uh, but I'll show you what's probably going on. So it laid over right up here, and uh, so he ran it out farther, it laid over, and I go, oh, what did, what did the previous look like? So I mean, it's identical, 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 identical. It's like, oh, why, why did it, why did it fall over over here? Well, what Kyle did was all of a sudden it just hit a spot in the map that he hasn't done yet. And you can see here, we got boost going up. Let me get rid of that close. It don't matter right now. Uh, you can see the pink line is boost. It's going up. Here, let's uh, expand this out a little bit. You got pink line. It's going up, that's boost, engine RPM's going up, and you can see right here too, right at this red, that's engine RPM, it also just kind of lays over. Like it's accelerating real hard and then it just starts laying over a little bit, even though boost is going up, and but this light blue line here is timing. And all of a sudden right here at uh, 7, well actually about 6800 or so, it starts going down. And that directly correlates engine RPM. Boost is boost is uh, uh, that doesn't have any bearing on obviously doesn't have any bearing on timing. It's just belt driven, so boost doesn't matter. But the uh, uh, engine RPM kind of lays over, gets a little soft. The timing's going down because it's taking a bunch of timing out of it, and the horsepower goes lays right over. And you can see right here, right at uh, sixty. Oh, that's like 7,000. It's already a little bit below, but it's actually about 6,800 or so. It starts taking timing out of it and doesn't need to take timing out of it on methanol. So Kyle just adds some timing right there. It'll pick back up. Run like a... Run good? Yeah. Yeah. She'll pick up a lot. <laughs> She'll pick up a lot. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Let's go. 2188 at 7400. <laughs> he comes running over here. 
It still lays over right up there, but yeah, I think it probably made probably, a bit more boost or something, or I don't know. We'll look at the data log. It's probably still safe on time. Well, wait, I know what it is, so it's still safe on timing up there. Yeah. So as things RPM faster, there is a, in, a delay in how things process. So it's an inductive delay. And so technically, uh, you would always be, technically, you would always be adding timing after peak torque in order to keep the exact same timing, technically, because it's delayed. So it probably needs a little more timing up there, but we're well exceeding the horsepower levels that he wanted to make on it. And, uh, and Kyle's still gotta make a change here, I see. Sorry, bud, to point this out to you, but guarantee it is not a Lamborghini V10. Yeah, whoops. Is this a 540? 540. This will change just slightly. Let's see what it does here. Go. The number of cylinders is eight, not What, 675 cubic inch? That'd be sweet. Where, eight, I didn't even know you could. Cylinders. Yeah, custom Yep, eight. Eight. Twenty-two thirteen. What Sweet. was it? It was twenty-one eighty-eight. Mm. Twenty-one eighty-eight. Yep. Yeah. So what it does is it's just calculating out an inertia factor. So there's a lot more inertia uh, weight mass into the engine. So as it accelerates, it figures out this inertia fa uh, inertia factor based on cubic inch and weights and so whatnot estimated weights for that kind of cubic inch. So, uh, it's much smaller stroke and it's actually a much smaller engine period than the Lamborghini. So anyways, yeah, 22, 13, 74. And you see it actually makes it, looks like it even makes it lay over just a little bit more out here. Uh, instead of just being flat, it actually humps down a little bit, but that's just because of where it's at now. Kyle can show you the uh, tune. And then this thing is ready to roll. So this has been, 10. Oh, 10 is not bad. Uh, once we got it running and got, you know, got it running, got through the starter issues, it's really it's decently smooth. 10 runs is not very many. So, it typically would take, sometimes it takes a lot more than 10, 10 pulls. I got a bunch on the Hemi over there. But, um, anyways, that's not too bad. I'm going to go back in my hole. Okay, see ya. All right, let's take a look at the data log real quick. You made a little bit more boost than what I thought it was gonna make at 8,000 RPM. We're at 29 pounds of boost. It's 27 degrees of timing. But uh, everything's looking pretty good. Our O2s are tracking really nice with each other. They're not too far separated. It's pulling fuel out of it. So I'll have to make some changes there. Uh, let me pull out a plug real quick. I can show you guys what the plug is. It's safe, I promise. All right, look at that plug. Looks no, absolutely no different than when we were making like 1850. So we're still plenty safe on timing. You can see our timing mark is still like not even all the way down the strap. So like my dad said, it'll probably take a bunch more timing up there, but like he also said, we're exceeding this guy's expectations on horsepower, so I'm sure he'll be real happy about that. And we're happy about that as well, so I'm gonna leave it alone, I think. All right, we had to take a break because we had to air out the room because me and Tim couldn't breathe in here, so. We're back just to say goodbye. I'm Kyle here at Steve Morris Engines. Thanks for watching the video. Like, subscribe, comment what you guys want to know about this engine. Me and my dad will both be up in the comments answering people's questions about the, this engine, our dyno process, anything you guys want to know. So, as usual, have a good one.